Good morning. Good morning. Actually, I was, um, you know, when I was thinking about our fireside chat, I was thinking about why is it called fireside chat? Um, anybody knows the origin of fireside chat? Where it came from? First time I learned about it. <laughs> the origin was in 1933, during Roosevelt's time, and he had dealt with the biggest two issues U.S. had um, in history, the Great Depression as well as World War II. And as this is an informal way of you know, communicating to the citizens of U.S. Um, through radio, and a journalist called it as Fireside Chat. And think about Fireside Chat in, sitting in Bangalore, we were sweating in yesterday, last night, and that's not a, you know, we were talking about yesterday changing narrative and all that. I think, should we change it to water cooler chat? Uh, changing is, is, is something which is uh, very uh, challenging. And um, I think, um, and maybe to discuss about the cloud, and, and, and I think, uh, and maybe I will rebound on your question, but, uh, uh, how the organization are able to change, digitalize, and go to uh, the next level, and how they are able to go to the cloud journey is something which is very difficult. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's a unique challenge for them to be able to scale uh, worldwide. And also, I think uh, it's a challenge internally, and I rebound about, I, I, I just listened about the people, the talent, uh, because I think the journey, the changing model, is really first. The issue is uh, the people. Um, I, I think, of course, we'll talk about technology, about the cloud, hybrid, public cloud, like all these type of things, Kubernetes, uh, containers, and things like this. But I, I really do believe that the best, biggest challenge companies have faced to move to this digitalization in the cloud is the people. And I see three factors for me. The first one is the talent, the skill set. Uh, it's clear that this type of technology will create uh, big challenges. Do you have enough internal uh, talents to adopt this journey? Um, the second is something which is also very important, is the attitude, the mindset. Because sometimes it breaks the culture, it breaks the, uh, um, the history, uh, and uh, it has to be able to uh, have the right culture to be able to embrace the journey. And the third one is the, journey, the governance. The governance of all the ecosystem. Because when you decide to move to these new technologies, to the cloud, the ecosystem changes. It's not only internally or not only externally, but in fact you will have a mixed where you have how you deal with the suppliers, but also how you deal with your customers, how you deal also internally, because the cloud allows you to scale, great, but sometimes costs scale, too. And so what does it mean? And how you interact and you make the governance, adequate governance. So I will say that, of course, technology is a key concern about this type of journey, and especially when you decide to move to the cloud journey. But people, for me, is the key aspect. I, I don't know what your perspective on that. What do you so, see when you're element? True. Uh, in, change, in change management, people is the key, right? But I have a question for you. You are one of the top 10 um, cloud operators in the world, and you're probably the largest in Europe as, you know. Well, the only European player, actually. <laughs> All of them are American, Chinese, and there is one Japanese, and we have one European, which is a VH Cloud, so we're very proud to be a European player, of, <laughs> and the only one on the market. And you also bought one of our assets. Hope you're happy with that. Yeah. Cloud. <laughs> Good. Um, so the question that I have is, uh, it's more reality check. Um, the research reports you know, show um, the various ones, doesn't matter which one you read. Um, the cloud world is, by 2020, is about $200 billion. It is disrupting uh, 1.5 trillion, trillion um, size of the traditional um, um, IT market. And, um, and 80 8, in excess of 80% of enterprises will be uh, on cloud, some form of cloud, private, public, hybrid. And being the largest European operator, or the only European operator, what's real in the enterprise space? What do you see there as a trend? Well, I think we see um, first that there is no one silver bullet. 
uh, maybe to oversimplify, I, I see that everything is going to the public cloud as a sort of uh, the silver bullet solution about the cloud will solve everything with the public cloud. But uh, and, uh, no, our multi-cloud will be the solution to solve all the problem. I think from our perspective is that we see first that uh, it's custom. Uh, each uh, company has uh, different challenges to address to go to the cloud. And as a customer, this is for me definitely something which is very important. And they need to be helped sometimes from external or from other people to be able to adic adequately adopt the right strategy to move to the cloud. Because it's not only technological, as I said, it's people, and also it's to decide what is the right mix between all these technologies. Of course, containers, uh, Docker solutions, microsystem solutions are an imperative. Now all the new applications are based on this type of technologies, and this is a, a trend which is exploding, and the capacity to move and compute and store data across the globe dynamically and scale is something which is really a major trend. But how you execute that, how do you control that, how do you master that, is something where I think each company has to really make a right picture about their own applications, legacy, digital native applications, and to be able to be sure that they adapt for each of them the right strategy to move to the cloud. Because there are so many solutions offering and the second point I would like to mention is something which is for us very important, and we see that mainly in Europe, is the reversibility of the data. The cloud offers to the customers a unique way to scale, a unique way to have access to immense resources, and in a way, it gives flexible tools. And flexibility is a great advantage for the cloud. But now we see more and more customers asking us, wow, that's great, but now I feel trapped. I put my offload, I put my data somewhere, and when I want to move them from different suppliers, different technology, costly or technologically, I'm trapped. So the advantage of the cloud, which is to give flexibility as a sort of uh, other face of the coin, which reversibility is not a reality. And so I think it's a challenge for the cloud industry to offer real multi-cloud and real reversibility to give really the customer the choice to choose what is really needed for them. You touched upon reversibility. Uh, I think let's, let's, let's explore why res reversibility is needed, right? I think uh, reversibility is an important topic for the enterprises. Uh, it could be uh, influenced by um, um, regulatory reasons, or uh, cloud providers may take advantage of the long, um, you know, the customer relationship and raise price points, yeah. and they should have a choice. All of that, right? And, um, and, you know, so how do we achieve reversibility here as an enterprise? Um, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, it's easy to achieve if you're just using cloud as a, uh, um, an infrastructure uh, service. You can move workloads easily between different clouds. But, uh, you know, how do you, you know, I think how do you prevent yourself from locking into a particular cloud and thereby um, you know, achieving reversibility. No, I think it's a, it's a key point, which is very difficult to address. Uh, and so as VH Cloud, we try to give reversibility to our tools. We are an infrastructure player. We are infrastructure as a service player, and we stick to the standards. So we have ecosystem of standards, uh, OpenStack standards, uh, all in type of uh, also VMware partners. Uh, we stick to the industry standards. And we want to give the capacity for the customers to uh, have this reversibility. We are even foolish enough to design tools to allow them to migrate in, but migrate out the data. So uh, we have, for example, in the SaaS environment, some partners where we help our customers to move their data from our data cloud to other clouds. Because we do believe that this is long term, the only way to be perceived as a real alternative and to give really the, the, ch the choice, the freedom of choice to our customers. So I think also the cost is a problem. Um, for example, we have a proof as OVH Cloud, we don't uh, offer the, any price for the bandwidth in and out. So it means that if you have a data somewhere in OVH and you want to transfer that to other place okay. outside, you don't pay for the bandwidth you use. It's a proof to say that we want to act for the reversibility. Because we know that uh, the bandwidth is extremely expensive 
for some uh, cloud providers, and it's a barrier to reversibility. So technologically, but also in terms of pricing, I think the industry long term has to prove that cloud is not a golden jail. It's something where the customer is not trapped long term. But you know, good news, uh, you know, the choice that you are offering to your customers. But if you really try to become a cloud native you know, uh, company, if you will, and take advantage of what each of those clouds offer as a native capability, uh, for example, if you, um, you know, build application based on Lambda, for example, or Azure functions, or uh, Google Cloud functions, there is no real way to get out of those uh, situations, right, from one cloud to another. And uh, so uh, tell me, you know, being a cloud operator, is there a real, you know, cloud portability or uh, multi-cloud possibilities? What are you guys doing to set standards as cloud operators? Is there real work happening there? No, Sorry mean, to put I, you on the spot. <laughs> I, I, give, I give you the question back. Do you think today there is a, a real, I mean, cooperation between the big names? Uh, do you think so? I can tell you. We try to work with all the cloud. One of our assets, you know, VMware uh, Foundation, uh, we try to have a relationship with uh, um, AWS or, um, or Azure, but uh, that's if you do uh, work on VMware stack, you can move around between these two clouds. But uh, you know, I'm talking about more pure, unless you use um, you know, standard Kubernetes or Mesos kind of uh, thing. Is there any work going on between cloud um, providers to uh, I mean, provide some interoperability? We, we, have, uh, uh, we have created a cloud foundation in Europe. Um, to create an ecosystem of uh, players which are sticking to the standards and allowing this capacity to exchange information and to exchange APIs, to exchange also all the black elements which allow this multi-cloud strategy. Um, and we have some big names which are in the Cloud Foundation. Uh, and and I, I think long term it's an, an absolutely necessary. We, are, we have managed Kubernetes services, for example. Uh, of course, we, we try to stick to the standards to be sure that each time we provide solutions to our customers based on uh, managed Kubernetes services, they are able to select because uh, one of the big advantages of containers is scalability. And if you provide scalability features and capacity, and if you provide only your solution, long term, it's a sort of strange scalability where it's only your solution which is allowed to your customer. So we really do believe that by doing a cloud foundation, for example, a type of ecosystem uh, like we've done in Europe and try to extend that worldwide is something which will enable and push the industry to continue really to create a real multi-cloud type of tech, I mean, culture. Uh, switching the gear, um, you know, you know the, the statistics kind of is a little uh, misguiding, right? We, we, were, we were kind of reaching nirvana, cloud nirvana, if you look at the 80 per plus percent uh, rep you know, uh, adoption of cloud, some form of cloud. But you offer all kinds of services um, um, on the cloud, storage as a service, yeah. server capacity, private cloud, public cloud, all of that is in our portfolio. So tell me about how, where do um, the customers start? What kind of typical journey they go through? And how do they get to that, you know, the real, you know, the cloud? Yeah. You know, given your customer base and varieties of services that you offer. I think I will a little bit disappoint you because I don't think there is one pattern. Um, I think um, because if you are a startup or if you are a big insurance company we've seen or else company, or if you are a bank, you don't have exactly the same constraints or the same issues to face. Uh, in France, for example, we have a lot of uh, banking companies as a customer, insurance company in Europe also, and there is a lot of um, regulations uh, about the data. And so the way you are going to compute and store the data is something which is very different if you're a startup and you're a pure digital thing. So I think the journey is a little bit different. Moreover, there is a, a concern which is rising in Europe a lot, is about uh, where is the data physically, and especially in the public cloud where, you, in fact, you don't know where is your data, and where is the legal umbrella of this data? You know that there is a lot of issue about, or concern about the privacy of the, of the data, um, and there were some scandals about all these type of things in the social media, but now also on the business side, 
the, the American uh, justice has just voted uh, what they call the Cloud Act, and it has created in Europe a lot of uh, debates about what does it mean, because in fact it's extraterritoriality to access to the data, even so the data is based outside of the US. And so a lot of I mean, French company or European companies are asking where I put my data, how I compute it, and what type of uh, solutions I will use to preserve the regulation, which is GDPR compliant, is it not GDPR compliant? And there is not one answer again. It depends really on the uh, type of uh, maturity of digitalization you are for a customer, but also it depends on the type of regulations, because if you're a banking or an insurance or health company, it's a little bit different when you are a pure startup company doing other things for the private services. So I think um, the chance we have as an uh, OVH cloud is we provide a full set. We are a pool pillar. We do only cloud. We do private cloud, public cloud, bar metal, VPS, all these type of things. To be able to mix, depending on the strategy of how the customer will adopt with the partner, because most of the time there are partners with us, because we do not fulfill all the customer needs. Should we explore this, you know, uh, the success factors for uh, for the enterprises um, to adopt cloud or scale in cloud. Uh, you know, yesterday um, um, I heard uh, through one of the sessions that um, it's it's uh, um, it's not overnight thing. It's a journey, yeah. right? Um, Endless journey. <laughs> Ram, you said that I think um, it's a journey. And journey. How do you really devise the journey? I mean, the way I think about journey is that. You really assess your portfolio, uh, tier your applications, and um, you know, if, uh, you know, find the low-hanging fruit, and and then move that to the cloud, and learn through it, and then you know, and if you haven't really virtualized, in many cases, enterprises still are not fully virtual, right? And, and um, the traditional data centers virtualize it and learn through it, and then move workloads gradually to uh, the cloud. So is that what you're seeing uh, yeah, as well? Yeah, I think journey. I say unlead journey because um, I, I'm thinking about one customer, and this morning we were discussing that, about uh, a customer we moved a very early stage in the cloud, and now they are moving back on premises some of our data because of regulations issues. And so, in fact, it, it, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> in sake, it's a sort of endless because they adopted very quickly a cloud strategy, moving all their workflows and all the data directly to the public cloud, and finally, the game, they beg, went back to some private because they had some, you know, they wanted to control a few uh, elements. And now they also put back on some premises. So I do believe that the uh, software industry, uh, the architecture industry will certainly be able more in sort of pure hybrid, including on premises. And we see that there are a lot of more announcements about all the cloud providers and the software uh, initiatives about the capability to have a complete ecosystem on premises, on the cloud. I don't think we love in the IT industry zero and one. We, we love a sort of, uh, I mean, you jump from zero to one. But in reality, uh, we see, especially in the big, large accounts, that there is a sort of very diverse. So also, I think another success factor is also about knowing the cloud essentials, learning about the clou cloud essentials. Cloud essentials being uh, what it means to be a cloud uh, company or on the cloud company, which is you know, the characteristics of the cloud being elastic, whether you are, you know, whether you are private cloud or public cloud um, you know, company, being knowing uh, what it means to be cloud is important as well, right? Being elastic and uh, automating and uh, you know, on-demand kind of uh, delivering everything as a service to your you know, internal customers. What do you think, where are you know, the enterprises uh, of your customer base in that? Do they know or just very early? Um, just to, to, to catch up your question, I think um, um, the, the, the point is definitely, um, again, I, I think the cloud is a cloud. It's some, something which is not monolithic. And as a cloud provider, our ambition and challenge is to be able to have uh, part of the solutions with an ecosystem which allow uh, really to move forward and to give all the type of solutions we can provide to uh, the systems. I, I, I think it will be very difficult 
for us, because we're too small as a cloud provider, to pretend to have 100% of the solution to our customers. That's the reason why we work a lot on the standards, we work a lot on the reversibility to provide these ecosystems of solutions uh, which have the same DNA as us, based on reversibility, transparency, the capacity to be very cost effective. And we need, to, of course, to be sure that we offer the basics. Uh, delivery, as you said, we are fully automatized. Uh, we deliver, for example, bar metal systems in, in 120 seconds. So it's very, very automatized. There is no, zero people involved in the way we deliver digitally. So if a customer wants to have a dedicated servers, we can deliver it in less than two minutes. And uh, it can put the type of system he wants. If he wants to have a Kubernetes, this is another thing. So we need to have the basics to offer this app, and we need really to automatize as quickly as possible to give really the promise of the cloud, which is flexibility, scalability. But at the same time, I think we need to have a portfolio of solutions in the ecosystem that the customer can always select AI solutions, any type of AI solution, machine learning, if they want to buy IoT. And, and, and we, we try not, uh, as a cloud provider, to, um, again, I, I use my, uh, my image of jail, sort of jail, we try to say to give always the choice, to always uh, give the capability to the customer to make and to have the freedom of choice. Because this is for us something long-term which will um, help us as a company to, in fact, uh, guarantee that we have a long-term relationship with our customer. And also because I think uh, we see already that for the cloud industry, it will be a challenge if we uh, are too conservative. Good. You know, I mean, also, I, I don't do know what your perspective on that. What do yeah. you think as a... I do. Um, um, agree with you. But also, I think the uh, air prices uh, are well served uh, in terms of uh, having success with the cloud um, is to know the transformational opportunities through the cloud as well, right? You know, what it offers to them. You know, one of the research reports that I read, uh, you know, doesn't matter which industry you're talking about, um, in the survey that I, uh, that I read, you know, survey targeted on CXOs that um, in, um, 60, in excess of 60, 70 percent of uh, respondents said that, you know, they are um, they're worried about what's happening in their space in terms of startups. doesn't matter, with retail, banking, manufacturing. And, um, you know, a few years from now, uh, they may be out of business and, and uh, they don't know really directionally what's happening in their industry either. Um, thanks to cloud native startups and all of that. Um, so that brings the question, do the enterprises, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of cloud in terms of their transformational agenda. If they have, um, uh, you know, unlimited resources, if they had to rebuild their business, would they do it the same way as they have been doing? How would they do it, right? And um, I think uh, it's important enterprises start thinking about cloud means what in terms of their business transformation. And, um, you know, I would ask, is there any other, you know, you touched upon the people-related thing, and what advice would you have for enterprises to be successful in terms of adopting cloud scale or cloud in its true sense uh, when it comes to choosing the right partners. I think you touched upon a lot of those elements already. Um, right, uh, you know, uh, help. Uh, not all, you know, skills are available within the enterprises, right? Um, you know, they are so steep in legacy. Um, you know, at the same time, that legacy knowledge is important for them to take advantage of to move to the cloud. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what other prescriptions you would have for uh, enterprises to be successful on the people, talent, and process? Oh, prescriptions is always uh, something I, I, I would be very modest about that. I think, however, if I, I would check an example of uh, a, a big retail uh, European player we are working with, and we are working with uh, Capgemini as a partner to help them to uh, migrate to the cloud. And what we see, for example, they have eShop uh, applications, which are very, very digital native applications. And so this has been moved very quickly to the cloud, and they've been to public cloud. But at the same time, they have the legacy systems, and which is nearly mainframe based, and they have a lot of difficulties because they have these applications where don't have the resilience even to be even on the private cloud was a challenge. And so they had to make a transformation even of their applications to be sure that these applications were able to be transformed. And so with the partner, we worked on transforming the application of this legacy system in the back end 
It was not really the front end, but the back end. Uh, accounting and uh, everything which is correlated with the inventory systems, the logistics. And so we, the, the, uh, the, the partner redeveloped part of the applications to be able to be cloud ready. Because the transition would have been too brutal. Because we know that when you have public cloud, the resilience uh, moving from uh, workloads uh, dynamically is great on the paper, but when the application is not prepared. So I think really for me, for large enterprise, the journey of um, migrating applications is really to make an inventory of the maturity by application, by systems, by type of things. Is it ready or not? Do I need to develop new applications? Do I need to transform some applications? Do I need to really rewrite sometimes a few pieces? So I don't have a lot of prescriptions. We work with consulting firms, uh, with uh, Accenture, Deloitte, people like this. We really can help better than us because we are not a SaaS provider. We are a high um, IAS, infrastructure as a service. And so we do not have the potential to have the expertise to be able to adapt everything. And, and, and to, but however, I think this is something which is really something important for our customers. Great conversation. Um, I think it's a journey. That's what the summary is. Journey. Yeah, journey. Endless the right journey. Help. Sorry, endless and journey. No <laughs> um, and um, a lot to gain as well. Uh, just, I can't help but um, close it with one um, reference to what Amit uh, uh, spoke about in the previous session. Uh, in the healthcare, um, the waste stage, $500 million in the US, and then a lot of errors, how what cloud and cloud platform can help prevent. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, my take is that, that's, you know, that's really um, uh, enhancing the lives of uh, already a high quality life in the Western world, but cloud can also help solve a lot of unsolved problems in a country like India. And we have uh, 1.3 billion people that don't have, majority of them don't have quality healthcare access. And traditional ways of uh, uh, solving that problem is not really uh, going to help. It never will happen. So cloud and you know, the digital can help solve a lot of, bridge the gap uh, hugely. Uh, one of the work that we are doing uh, with the government of India is to provide, you know, a, a, you know, a health, a cloud healthcare platform um, serving hundreds of millions of people um, you know, uh, and their digital um, and health records on the cloud and uh, the public care workers being able to access it, uh, track it, and deliver better quality services to citizens. It's getting rolled out um, across 160 districts uh, in the country, covering about 100 million people in phase one. Yeah. And the goal is to uh, take it to in the next couple of years to 300 million people. That That's the kind of impact scale uh, and a cloud can offer to solving problems. Which is great. Thank you. Thank you very much.